and when I uh, got out of the Navy, I was a lieutenant. I was based in Catlo, it was a fishing village, uh, and not far from Vung Tau, which was actually an in-country R&R center, so it was a relatively safe area. Uh, the uh, accommodations, I mean, we were in Quonset huts when we weren't on patrol. Uh, there was a lot of camaraderie, a lot of, of um, feeling of brotherhood, you know. But when you were on patrol, early in, in, the, in that war, for, for me, we'd be by ourselves in a river, uh, just patrolling and, and checking IDs, fishing vessels. Um, if a boat got in trouble, typically, uh, Every swift boat that was close by would come and try and help. That would be a singular priority. But uh, a lot of the times, um, it was uh, you were on your own. But here's an interesting thing. Aside from the enemy, the scariest thing, and, and I think all swift boat sailors will tell you this, was the seas. For six months of the year, we had incredibly heavy seas. And uh, we lost almost as many swift boats to the ocean as we did to enemy fire. And uh, some would get rolled over, some would get pitch pulled. But getting into those rivers with these monster waves uh, was, was really tough. But um, it, the funny thing is, is that it was so rough out in the ocean that we would prefer to be in the calm rivers, even though there was a chance of a firefight, than having our brains knocked out uh, in, in, the, uh, in, this, in the heavy seas. We. Um, we were getting to know the, the, the fishermen and, and starting to build a rapport with the local fishermen. And they knew we were there to, uh, to actually protect them from the BC, who were in some cases just you know, trying to collect tax money from them to fund their war. Um, and so we started trading with them. We would give them steak and they would give us lobster. And that was really nice. Now we had two buckets on the fantail. And, and one bucket was used as a toilet because the toilet down below, nobody wanted to be inside the cabin uh, when we were in the rivers because if a B-40 rocket hit the boat, it's going to explode inside. So we used a bucket on the fantail. So the other bucket was for the lobster. So we made sure we labeled <laughs> the buckets. I believe that the, the actual combat was maybe less than 20% of the time. 80% of the time was just tension. You were, you were ready for it, um, you expected it, uh, but it didn't happen. Um, and, and so, but there were certain areas that were really bad. And, and in those cases, that percentage uh, of combat went up. But in a lot of the rivers, in the Mekong Delta, for example, it was, uh, it was more the 80-20 the rule. Um, but I have a funny story for you. The, the, the rivers, at certain times of the year, would flood the, the rice paddies. Um, and, and so you couldn't tell where the river was. And so you'd have to really go slow and watch your fathometer, but your radar would not tell you, especially at night, where the river was. And, and so at night, this one swift boat saw a target on the radar, and they were sure it was a sandpan. And at night, it means it's enemy. So they go full bore, going as fast as they can, to intercept this sandpan, and suddenly they find themselves going over a rice paddy. And they went 50 feet beyond the river bank in about three feet of water. Now they're stuck. The next morning, the, the tides went out, and now it's clear that they're in a rice paddy, and, 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 and this, this object was a water buffalo that was standing in the rice paddies. So to get that boat back, into the river. They had to take the, the propellers off. And they, they had the, uh, one of the operations in the Mekong Delta was a, a thing called Irma La Douche, uh, or Irma La Douche. It was a water can, and they used it to dissolve the mud bunkers that the, that the Viet Cong were building, because bullets wouldn't go through those mud bunkers, but water would just dissolve it like a sandcastle. So they used Irma La Douche to to dissolve a trench behind the swift boat 